This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey, welcome to it. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. And I am your host, Spencer Durant. And it is another wonderfully chilly little night here in Wyoming. Uh, Snow's on the ground. Sun's behind the clouds. And nobody's out doing anything because it's cold as I'll get out right now. So just another reason to avoid Wyoming. You know, make sure you spend your fishing time, you know, in, in states with a more welcoming climate like Montana and Idaho, where, you know, plus all the fishing's better over there too. Don't bother yourself coming here to Wyoming. All right. Don't I wouldn't want you to waste your time. All right. On, on a fishing trip. That that's the last thing I would ever want to see is somebody just not have a good time. So, you know, just just drive right on through Wyoming, just head right to Montana or Idaho, and you'll be you'll be in good shape. <laughs> Speaking of Idaho, actually, that's where our first guest, uh, or not our first guest, pardon me. Uh, the first question is from Krista in Idaho. So we're just gonna jump right into the show tonight. So Krista from Idaho, she asks, how do you efficiently and effectively organize your fly boxes by stage, by bug type? Is it best to have multiple small boxes or one big one? When fishing rivers recently, waiting for the day, going a couple miles away from the vehicle, there were times when I wished I had a fly that I left behind because there wasn't room in my pack slash waders. Krista, that's a really good question. Glad you asked this one. So if you go ahead and you pose this question to the interwebs, so you put it out there in the Google machine and ask for an answer. Uh, you're going to find that it's one of the many things in fly fishing where there's not like a true quote unquote best way to organize your fly box. You're going to find a ton of different opinions on the subject. So uh, what I did was I looked for like kind of the, the tactics that were most recommended uh, on how to organize your fly box. And we'll discuss some of those and then I'll give you my two cents as well. So, uh, you know, with all that said, there's you know kind of three big ways to organize uh your flies. So you can organize them all by type. All right. So that means you'd have all your nymphs in one box, your dries in another, the mergers in a different box. All right. So that's how you'd organize things by type. You're gonna organize by size, that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. All your 18s, 16s in one box, 14s, 12s on another, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, organizing by hatch would mean that you put all of your blue wings together, uh, all the nymphs, the dries, emergers, and cripples. Okay, and then you're going to have a caddis box as all your nymph or all your caddis nymphs, dries, emergers, cripples, etc. Uh, these are all really solid ways to organize flies, and they all have their own merits, uh, pros and cons to all of them. Really, like a lot of things in fly fishing, okay, it boils down to personal preference here. You're going to pick a way to organize your fly box that's based on what works best for you. Okay. Now, to get kind of the meat of your question here, Krista, uh, you know, yours was, should I have multiple small boxes or one big one? How do I make sure I'm not leaving flies behind that I really need when I'm out of the water? So what I do, Krista, I carry four fly boxes. Uh, I just have a small chest pack that I wear. Uh, I don't want to plug the product here, uh, but it's a fairly common chest pack. Uh, and I can fit, uh, I have four fly boxes. Like I said, I can fit three of the kind of regular size tacky boxes. They're just like the regular width, regular size. They're not the, uh, the big bug streamer ones, just your standard tacky box. And then, uh, I've got a smaller Umqua compartment box that I use for my dry flies. Uh, I keep all my dry flies in the compartment box so that the hackle doesn't get crushed. I don't like how uh, regular fly boxes crush the hackle on dry flies. Uh, I'm a little OCD about that, so uh, you might not care, but that's that's what I've got all my flies in. Now, what I've done with that is I've gone ahead and I've organized all of those flies by type. So uh, not only are they organized by type, though, but I stuff my boxes with only patterns that I know I'm going to go ahead and use. So, and, and that brings up something else too that I think is worth talking about here, where I think early on in fly fishing, we all kind of get 
at some point, I think we all get enraptured with the uh, menagerie of fly options that are out there. There's so many different flies, so many different patterns, and you walk into a fly shop, and it's like a kid in a candy store, but difference is you've got a credit card, all right? So you you can buy all that stuff that you see. Now, should you? No. Can you? You bet. Uh the same, same concept, though. You, you know, your eyes kind of get bigger in your stomach. A lot of these flies that we look at, are you ever actually going to use them? Uh, I think, I don't think John Gearock was the originator of this theory, but he did write it, I believe, where he talked about how uh, anglers really kind of go, you know, we want all those flies at the beginning when we start fishing. And then we kind of, as we... As we progress as anglers, we kind of winnow down our fly selection to the bugs that we use frequently. And, you know, generally it's maybe a couple dozen patterns, really, that we cycle through. And that's really about all that I ever use. I just cycle through a couple dozen different patterns uh, throughout the year in my home waters here in Wyoming and back where I used to live in Utah. So throughout the Rockies, I don't have a huge variation in patterns. Uh, so I organize my boxes based on type. So I've got all my nymphs in one box, uh, emergers in another box, dries in another box. And then I just kind of have like a catch all box for stuff that, you know, like my hoppers or some streamers or whatever it's going to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll have some spent wings in there as well, but, I really, I focus more on a wide variety of flies within the patterns that I use. So that's, that's my guiding principle. All right. Is I focus on the patterns that I know I'm going to use all the time, but I want a lot of variety within those. So I've got my midges, I've got my caddis, I've got my mayflies, I've got nymphs for all of those bugs. All right. I've got Stonefly nymphs, uh, and you know, streamers, hoppers, some egg patterns, some stuff that's not really a nymph of anything. That's really kind of about it. And, in, you know, so for example, I have a bunch of Frenchies, but I have them in a few different sizes with a bunch of different colored bead heads because some days it really does feel like the fish just want the Frenchie with the gold bead. They don't want the one with the silver. They want the one with the gold. Now, that doesn't happen all that often, but when it does, it's nice to have the variety within the flies that you need. So, uh, it, if I'm going to a different place that I've never fished before and there's like specific patterns that I need for that, like when I go to Pyramid Lake, uh, I type the Coronamids and the Tui Chub Leeches just for Pyramid because they're just, they're just a little bit different than what I use here. Some of them work here. Uh, but I, you know, I'll go specific patterns for stuff like that, and I'll I'll make room in a box for them at that point. But really, that's what I would recommend: just look at those patterns that you use all the time, and tie a bunch of variety within those. Because most of the time, your fly choice it's important, but your presentation matters way more. So you can get fish to hit a fly as long as you present it right, and that fly is kind of within the general norm of what should be on the water or in the water at that time of the year. So to sum it all up, I think about three to four boxes uh, is probably enough for most of us anglers. Put all your dries in one box and then organize the other boxes however you choose. Instead of going for a huge variety of patterns, I'd recommend having a variety of the bugs that you use all the time. Okay, That means a bunch of zebra midges, a bunch of fringies, a bunch of hare's ears, parachute atoms, elk hair caddis, waltz worms, globe bugs, the stuff that you reach for when you're going to go set up a rig on your home water. Those are the flies that you want to have a bunch of and that you always want to have in your box. And as long as you do a good job of keeping those stock with everything that you need, you carry those four boxes with you. I think, Christy, you're not going to run into the issue where you don't have the fly that you really want. So that would be my uh, two cents here on the fly box section. So thank you very much, Krista. Great, great question. All right, our next question. I live in Utah, and this is my first fall slash winter season, and I've been going through a dry spell. What tactics, tips, advice can y'all give for a beginner during this part of the season? Rigs, flies, location of fish during colder months, etc. Thanks. And this is uh, from Clayton in Utah. Clayton, uh, thanks a whole bunch for this one. I grew up in Utah, actually, so this is there's a lot of fishing in Utah that's near and dear to my heart. It raised me as a fly flinger. 
All right, that's where I learned the subtle art of flinging these flies out to the trout. So, uh, you know, everybody else that's listening, just if you want just like a, a incomparable fishing experience, something you are never going to be able to have anywhere else, just drive straight on through Wyoming, straight to Utah. Don't stop in Wyoming, all right? Go straight to Utah. Park yourself on the lower Provo River. Get out. Throw some nymphs. Best fishing you're ever going to have in your entire life. Guaranteed. All right. You're just, it's going to blow your mind. So just everybody go lower Provo River. Park yourself right there. Get yourself a sow bug. All right. That's what they want. And just go to town. All right. Drive straight through Wyoming. We don't, in fact, you know, Wyoming's not even worth your time anymore. We don't have any fish in Wyoming anymore. No trout anyway. We replaced it all with carp. Actually, um, wait, no, shoot. Now the carp anglers are going to want to come up here. Uh, all our fish drowned. Actually, we have no fish in Wyoming. They are uh, gone, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> kidding aside, kidding aside, Utah is near and dear to my heart. There's a lot of great fish in there. So, Clayton, I understand where you're at because I've been in your shoes before. All right. Uh, key things to remember. I went through, I did some research, pulled some stuff from some experts, and I'm going to be pulling a lot from an article that Tom Rosenbauer wrote for Orvis. That's going to get linked in the podcast description, so you can read through Tom's article on this subject, and he'll he'll go into a ton of detail, because that's just kind of guy Tom is. Great guy. Great guy. Really appreciate everything that Tom has done for us. Anyways, the big thing that Tom reminds us, uh, all anglers, is that during the winter, the water gets a lot lower, water gets a lot clearer, and we lose a lot of our streamside vegetation. So the fish are not going to hang out in the same places in the winter that they hang out during the summer. And there's a few reasons for that, all right? First off, they're going to hang out in different water because there's not a lot of bug activity going on in the winter, all right? During the summer, during the spring, when there's a lot of bug activity going on, you will find fish in riffles and runs because that's where a lot of the bugs are hatching, right? The extra effort that they expend when they live in that fast water is worth it because there's so much aquatic insect life, all right? It's like going to a buffet, okay? It's worth the price you know you're going to pay later, okay? When you get home and all that buffet food's got to come out, you know you're paying a price, right? But it's worth it because there's all that food right there and you can just eat until you hate yourself. Okay, so it's it's like going to a buffet. Think of it like that. It's worth it. But in the winter, the buffet is gone. So why would you why would you go to the buffet when the buffet is closed? Right. That's kind of that. That's a, one way to think of this with trout. Why would they sit in the riffles when there's no food there? They're not going to. All right. What they're going to do is they're going to look for uh, deeper, slower water that has some current coming through it. That can deliver food to them. And this is where the lower water with the extra water clarity and the lack of streamside vegetation comes into play. Because at this point, the lack of streamside vegetation, the lower, clearer water, actually makes it harder for the fish to hide from predators. So not only are they going to hang out in different places because of the food availability, they're going to hang out in different spots because the lack of cover where we find fish during the summer months, they don't want to sit there and make themselves an easy target for predators. They want to seek out a place that's going to keep them safe from getting nabbed by uh, a hawk, an eagle, an otter, a uh, really over-enthusiastic spear fisherman, you know, whatever it is, they want to, they want to be safe. So Tom Rosenbauer, uh, what he suggests that you look for is pools that are at least three feet deep or more and that have some in-water cover. Okay, these are the places that are going to attract trout. We're talking submerged logs, big rocks they can hide behind, stuff like that where they can the water is broken up or it's just not as clear. They can hang out and they have a reasonable access to food, but they're not putting themselves directly in harm's way like they would if they're hanging out in the riffles or right next to the bank like they do during the summer and spring where they can just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Because at the end of the day, the fish want to expend the least amount of energy for the most amount of food. So that means they're going to be looking for these pools where there is a current, but not much of one, right? So sum that up, look for slower water that's got plenty of cover 
that's where you're going to find trout during the winter months, right? The dead stool pools probably won't hold any fish because there's no current in them to deliver that food to the trout. Now, uh, as far as the rigs and flies portion of your question is concerned here, Clayton, the big thing to focus on during winter, uh, bug-wise, going to be midges and mayflies, specifically betas, okay? So blue-winged olive mayflies. That's what, that's what the betas refers to generally, okay? So those really small blue-winged olives. So uh, midges are actually the only aquatic insect that goes through a full life cycle in the winter. So you actually will see midges hatching up on the surface during the warmer days. That's a ton of fun. If you get yourself into a winter midge hatch, just thank your lucky stars because there ain't nothing like fishing a winter midge hatch. I love it. Dries in January just hit a little bit different. I don't know what it is. It's just a ton of fun. Some folks give me grief for loving it as much as I do. Grant, what are you doing loving that so much? Well, I, I do. I like casting dry flies when I can't feel my fingers. I like casting dry flies, period. And I'll take any opportunity I can to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, that being said, nymphs are going to be what your your go-to is, right? Nymphs in the winter. A two-nymph setup, uh, usually with an attractor pattern, kind of like a rainbow warrior, followed by a zebra midge. That's going to be a really effective uh, way to present flies. That's going to be a good rig for you. Okay. There's usually quite a few mayfly nymphs kicking around this time of year too. So pheasant tails, Frenchies, paradigons, anything that's tied to remotely look like a mayfly nymph, uh, that, that'd be a great one to use this time of year as well. So what's important to remember, especially in winter, same thing I told Krista uh, from Idaho, is that your presentation matters a lot more than the fly choice. So if you get a reasonable bug drifting right in front of a trout in the middle of winter, chances are you're going to hook into a few fish, right? By a reasonable bug, I mean something that should be there. Okay, midges, mayfly nymphs, sow bugs, scuds. Don't throw a hopper out there and expect them to hit the hopper in February. I would love for that to happen. I'm still waiting on it, and I fish a hopper in February every now and then, just on the off chance that I find the one fish that will finally eat it. I think that would just be a blast if I got a fish on a hopper in February. The latest I've ever had a fish hit a hopper, I think, was November. I think it was the latest in the year, but I've never had a fish take a hopper later than November. And I don't know, I don't know what I was doing fishing a hopper in November, and I certainly don't know what that trout was doing eating it in November, but it happened. So, anyways, all that is to say, stick with the midges and mayfly nymphs in the winter. Focus on getting a really good drift, getting your flies down to where those fish are likely hanging out, and you're going to be in business. So thank you very much, Clayton. That was a great, great question. All right, and our last question for the day comes to us, uh, Sean from Oregon. As a beginner, what is the best way to learn which fly to use or get or to learn hatches? I've gone to local fly shops, and they're very informative, but it can be overwhelming. Is there a good way to learn which fly to use without being overwhelmed. Again, that's from Sean from Oregon. Sean, this is a fantastic question. Actually, uh, it's something that every beginner faces. Uh, unless you're lucky to be born into a fly fishing family, you're going to really face this uh, a lot. So we actually have a series of articles on how to pick the right fly over at the VFC block, and I'll go ahead and link those in the podcast description too. Uh, they're they're pretty in-depth and uh, goes through all the different situations that you'll find yourself out in on the water and how to know what fly to pick. All right. So I would highly recommend everybody read through that. It's a great resource. Uh, I'm not just saying that because I wrote it, uh, I'm saying that because I believe it's a good resource for you. I put it together because I wanted to help answer this question in a way that you can go back to and reference a lot easier than maybe trying to find the exact uh, point in this podcast, right, where we're talking about it. So uh, that being said, we will dive into this a little bit here. What I would recommend that beginners keep in mind about fly choice is that at the end of the day, it really is pretty simple. Okay, Trout see a wide variety of bugs every day. Your fly choice is important, but your presentation matters the most. That's kind of been the theme of this episode. I think we'll call it presentation. It matters the most. Something like that. <laughs> but seriously, though, your presentations really do matter a lot. 
Okay, without a good presentation, even the best flies aren't going to get eaten. It has to look good. And if it doesn't look good, fish aren't going to look at it, no matter how perfect your fly is. So, again, uh, I want to plug the series of articles on our blog, but I'm going to go ahead and summarize it here uh, for you. So, knowing what fly to use, even if you don't know a whole lot about bugs, really comes down to the skill of observation, right? If you take a few minutes to observe the water that you're fishing, you will get enough clues to piece together what fly to pull from your box. For example, let's say I go to the river and I see fish rising. Okay, I see fish rising. I'm just going to start casting and blindly casting and just go nuts, right? That's what you do when you see fish rising. Wrong. Okay. What you should do and what I had to learn how to do, even though I was born into a fly fishing family, I wasn't, wasn't exactly taught. I was thrown into the fire <laughs> to learn. Okay, what I had to learn how to do is to stop and observe the fish for a few minutes. Okay. That means stopping and looking at what bugs are on the water, what bugs are on the air, so that I have an idea of what the fish are eating. Once I've identified that, then it's a simple process of matching the bugs that I see in the air or on the water to the patterns that are in my box. Okay, and the same thing goes for identifying nymphs. If you roll up to the river and the fish aren't eating off the surface, you don't have to pack everything up and go home, right? Pull some rocks up instead. Look at the bugs that are crawling around under those rocks. Match those bugs to patterns you have in your box, and you're going to be in business. Now, if you know nothing about flies at all, you can do that. It's a little labor-intensive, and you can do it. You can lessen that learning curve, though, if you take the time to learn a little bit about the aquatic insects that are most common in the waters that you fish. All right. For example, you don't want to buy a whole bunch of stonefly nymphs to go fish uh this little spring creek that doesn't have any stoneflies in it okay you want to make sure that you have you have a base knowledge you know okay there's midges there's caddis in this river this time of year so i want to focus on midges and caddis patterns and then when you get to the river you already know okay what i'm going to see is going to be midges or caddis now i just have to match that to whatever's in my box now that being said sean you did mention going to a fly shop and how it's informative but it's overwhelming. You're right. It can be really overwhelming in a fly shop. I still walk into fly shops sometime and go like, oh, shoot, there's a lot in here. <laughs> so, uh, but it also is less overwhelming if you know the right questions to ask when you go in. So that brings us back to the point I made just a second ago, where if you ask the fly shop workers, hey, what bugs are the flies, are the fish eating right now? What flies are the fish going for right now? Chances are it's going to be some kind of mayfly caddis or midge, all right? The fly shop workers are going to be able to show you, hey, these are patterns. They're specifically tied for our local waters. These are the patterns that you should have. Then you take those patterns, you go out to the river, and you already know I've got the right patterns. You start matching those to what's in the, in the water under the rocks for nymphs or what's on the water in the air for the dry flies. And you know, okay, this pattern looks like this bug. I'm going to tie this on. All of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of extra confidence going into this than if you just open your box and think, oh, well, this fly looks pretty. I'm going to tie this on and hope that the fish thinks it looks pretty, too. You don't want to be in that position. Uh, I've been in that position a lot, and it's not a fun one to be in. All right? You want to avoid that as much as possible. So uh, I would recommend that you focus on putting together a good collection of mayfly, midge, and caddis patterns. All right? Those three insects make up the diet of tons of trout across the country, and you can catch fish on those bugs just about anywhere. Now, keep in mind as well, Sean, that bugs hatch at different times of the year, too. So what's hatching in December is going to be different from what's hatching in June. So to recap this, take a look at the series we have on Picking the Right Fly. Again, that is linked in the podcast description. It's also on the Ventures Fly Co. blog, which is blog.venturesflyco.com. Right when you're on the water, pick the fly. Picking the right fly is all about observational skills. Pay attention to what the fish are eating, and then try to match those bugs to the patterns that you have in your fly box. Just stock your fly box up with the right patterns. Talk to your local fly shop about the bugs that hatch in your stream. Chances are it's going to be a mix of caddis, mayflies, and midges. So 
That might feel like kind of a shorter answer to this question, Sean. That's why I'm recommending the series of articles on the website because we go into a lot of detail. It's a big six or seven part series. Uh, I want to say six part. I might be wrong, but there's a lot in there. So take a look at that and I'm sure it'll help out quite a bit. Thanks for the question. All right. Now to wrap this up, uh, I'm going to tell you guys a little story. So I, if you're uh, if you're new to the podcast, that's how I like to end the show. Just telling a story that's got some kind of lesson that you can take from it. Uh, so hopefully you can learn from my failures. All right. I want to share my failures with you so that you learn from them and don't make the same mistakes that I did. So Pyramid Lake. You've probably heard of it. It's the land of the giant cutthroat trout. It's out in Nevada. If you want to catch a 20-pound cutthroat trout on a fly rod, your chance to do it at Pyramid Lake is greater than anywhere else on the planet, probably. I love cutthroat trout. I have a an healthy obsession with cutthroat trout. And when Pyramid Lake really started to heat up in the last, oh, six or seven years, when it really just kind of exploded back onto the fly fishing scene, I started going out there. And I actually wrote a story about this for Hatch Magazine. I went out there for... Uh, three years and did not catch anything in three years worth of trips. That was really frustrating. Uh, <laughs> really, really, really frustrating. And on one of those trips, I was out there. I was with my good buddy Hiram Weaver. He actually runs High on the Fly. They have some fantastic apparel, and I'll actually put a link to uh, them in the uh, podcast description too. Uh, really killer hats and uh, neck gaiters, uh, just great stuff. So I'm with my buddy Hiram. We're we're out there at Pyramid, and he'd, I think he just barely caught a 15 pound cutthroat. So it, he caught a really good fish. It was 30 something inches long. It was a big fish, and I hadn't had a bite yet. So I was really kind of jealous of Hiram because, well, he caught a really big fish and I didn't. So that's frustrating, right? Well. I'm sitting there on my ladder and I'm watching my indicator and I'm thinking about all sorts of other things and I'm getting a little bored. And then what happens? But my indicator goes down and I almost forgot to set the hook, but thankfully I did set the hook. I set the hook and the line went slack. Yeah. Yeah. Set the hook, line went slack. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out why it went slack. It didn't make any sense because I set the hook right. And these fish at Pyramid, it's not, at least that day, they weren't being shy with their takes. When they took it, it was very obvious. It wasn't a really subtle, soft take that you could really miss. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, then I missed another one. And after the second one that I missed, I got really frustrated. So I pulled my line and take a look at it. And my leader was all curled up and it wasn't in very good shape from like three feet above my first fly all the way through down to my second fly. Cause I was fishing a two fly rig, I believe. And it was just curled up and just not in good shape. It just kind of nasty. Like an old leader gets after it's just been stretched out a lot and it's just got a lot of memory and when I went to pull on the fly, you could feel the line kind of stretch a little bit. So no wonder I missed those fish because I didn't have any backbone in the, in the tippet and the leader to set the hook into the fish. So, of course, I'm going to miss it at that point, right? So I, I got really upset because I missed a shot at two fish because my leader and my tippet weren't in good shape. So the moral of this story, boys and girls, is Make sure your leader and tippet's in good shape, all right? Check that stuff on a regular basis. Don't just throw it out there and assume that it's okay, all right? Make sure it's in good shape. Otherwise, you run the risk of losing a really nice fish the way that I ran the risk of, or not run the risk, I did lose those two big cutthroat. Now, how big were they? I don't know, but probably Probably bigger than the cutthroat I catch here in Wyoming. All right, I'll just put it out there. You know, probably a little bit bigger than that. So 
that's moral of the story. Make sure your tackle and everything else is in good shape so that you don't have that heartbreak moment of losing a really good fish. So with that, uh, thank you guys uh, for being with us on the show this week. Appreciate it. If you want to have your questions answered, there is a link in the podcast description where you can go submit questions. We'll answer them on the show. As always, get out there, get some fishing done. Have a great time. And until next week, tight lines, everybody.